Hi everyone, my name is Chris Farrell and I am an adult and seniors programmer at the Brantford Public Library. I will be your host today and Robin Harding, our adult programming coordinator will also be attending this session. I would like to thank everyone for joining us for the first webinar of our Declutter, Downsize, Decorate series. Uh, just a few housekeeping details before I introduce our speaker. Uh, all of you will be able to view the speakers uh, and speaker and host, but we'll have the audio turned off until the end of the information session. There are two options for asking questions. One is the chat feature, and you can type in uh, your question, or you can click on the put up your hand function, and then you can ask your question verbally at the end. Keep in mind the session is being recorded, and we'll begin. Our webinar today is Decluttering Tips and Tools for a Simpler Life. Samantha Christofferson, and her husband, Emilio Jose Garcia Rodriguez, are the husband and wife duo behind KW Professional Organizers. Since 2012, they have been helping people transform their lives by organizing their belongings. Known for their caring approach, KW Professional Organizers can help you find intention and meaning in life. In 2017, they published their debut book, A Recipe for an Extraordinary Life, which is all about self-care through organization and minimalism. Today, Samantha is joining us and she will provide decluttering tips and tools to help organize your home, help save time and keep life simple. And without, now without further ado, I'm happy to welcome Samantha. Yay, thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for uh, inviting us here to speak and, and for organizing this series in the first place. I have to say it's lovely. I have created uh, some slides, some visuals for us to look at. Um, so I'm going to put that on the screen now. And as Chris said, if you do have any questions, you can keep them until the end if you want to ask verbally or feel free to use the chat. I will be able to kind of see that on my screen. And uh, yeah, uh, Chris is so organized. She asked us about this a few months ago. And so we had time to really think about what we could share the tools um, that we use on a regular basis to help people uh, get organized in their home to kind of build maintenance systems for once you get organized. So that's what this is based off of, what our presentation is based off of. And I would like to say that giving you an introduction into how we came to do what we did is by being really interested in helping people turn a system that wasn't working in their home into something that was really functional. So we would often come into spaces like you could see on the screen here, uh, craft rooms that had kind of become dumping grounds, but the motivation was there and they wanted to get it back to a place where they could use it. This was a family who wanted to get their car in the garage because they had a baby on the way and didn't want to scrape the windows in the winter time. So just having these examples before you, I hope kind of breaks down a little bit of a barrier, helps give us something that we can share as a common language to use. Uh, Emilio and I have been teaching online now for four years. We teach online courses about organization, minimalism and self-care on Skillshare, on a website called Udemy, uh, on our own academy, which is um, accessible from our website. And we're registered professional organizers in Canada and have training in mental health first aid, all of which I think kind of adds to our approach and in, in how we help our clients and how we help people when they ask us questions about organization. And three of the things that people always come to us and share is that they feel overwhelmed at the idea of getting organized. They have no idea where to start. Sometimes, I don't know if you can relate to this, but you know all the things you have to do, but you just feel so paralyzed and even knowing what, well, what room do I start in? Or what area of this space do I start in? Or how do I get started? Um, and again, if any of these things resonate with you or there's something that I missed, feel free to pop it into the chat. And the last thing, which maybe is starting to change a little bit from what we're hearing from people, was not having enough time. Some people are even more strapped for time now that COVID restrictions are adding a lot of procedures, um, kind of these kinds of things adding to the day. I know ourselves dropping our daughter off at, at daycare, we have to do, go, go through a lot of screening processes every morning and it adds time. So not enough time was another struggle for a lot of people. 
Um, and oftentimes I, I tend to doodle my thoughts. And this was some of the feelings that I was getting when after working with people is that a lot of people felt unhappy under the weight of their belongings, um, out of the things that we choose to have around us. And all we all want to do is to live a content, happy, intentional life. And sometimes the stuff was getting in the way of that. Um, and I wanted to talk about how there's different forms of clutter um, because uh, we're talking about organization in the physical sense, which I think we kind of all get, but there's mental clutter. So like this little cartoon bunny, his head's just exploding, you know, all of the things that you're remembering to do or you ought to do or you feel you should be doing or time is flying by. Um, mental clutter can really have a huge impact. Um, and sometimes it, 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 it creates things in our space. So I don't know if anybody can, can relate with some of these pictures. So the before and moving into an after state and just that feeling that you get when you look at something here and that's not judgmental, this happens, clutter happens, but the feeling that you get from, oh, well, I know I can go and sit at the table here. I don't know how to start in this room. This client just wanted to be able to sew and do projects and just setting up the spaces, even if they don't look like a magazine, it makes them feel relaxed. It helps them move on with the more important things in their life. It helps them create opportunities and, you know, gives you those feelings of feeling um, like you're in your own home, like it's safe to be at home. So we always just talk about why take the time to set up and get organized and create your ideal space. And you can see on the screen, our ideas are you save time in the long run. It's easier to be productive. You get peace of mind. A lot of people say it's like a weight being lifted off you. Um, and so that's really why we're here. And so if I could get you all to be in there with me, it kind of feels a little bit weird because normally we'd be in the Brantford Library and we'd be cozy back in the back space there. And we'd be sharing a little bit and maybe I'd even see some of your heads nodding or somebody might uh, affirm kind of what I'm saying with a little bit of uh, feedback. But I want you to take a moment now and think about what do you love in your home? I personally, I washed the windows this morning. We had construction all last fall. I washed the windows and it reminded me how much I love the light in our apartment here. It's just now that the windows are clean and the dust is gone, it feels so good. That's something I love. Something that I hate, well, if you were to ever take a visit to our bathroom, you can touch everything from the tub to the sink to the cupboard from the toilet. It is just such a small space. And that is something that I strongly dislike from our apartment. I would love just a little bit more room to turn around. Um, so thinking of these kinds of things, what are the loves? What are the hates? And the reason why we get you to get into that state where you're thinking of that, because it's going to help us be able to share with you what tools are best for your project. Thinking about why did you come here today? I'm grateful that you're here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so I'm going to take you through these 12 tools that I've kind of put aside and I'll go through them one by one and recognize that not all of them might help you in your specific project. Maybe someone's here because they really want to get their photographs organized. They've got boxes of photographs. They've inherited photographs. That's your, that's your project you're thinking of. Maybe some of you are uh, like Chris on her holidays coming up, going to be heading out into the garden and open up the tool shed or the garage and realize, you know, everything got thrown away in the fall and it's kind of a little bit messy and trying to figure out where things are. Maybe that's your project. So I just want you to keep that in mind that these tools are meant to help, but they're not going to apply to everyone. So if you do have questions or comments, please let me know. The first tool that we use and we employ with every client and that we recommend people is using your planning, using your brain a little bit before you get physical, before you um, work on anything, pull anything out. It's thinking about your ideal space. And when you can visualize and think about what your ideal outcome is going to be, it is more likely going to unfold the way you want it to without the hiccups. So here, this ideal space, this is a worksheet that we came up with. Normally, if we were in the classroom together, you might have one in front of you and we'd say, okay, let's, let's just fill this out. And, and this might seem simple, but it's actually very complicated. So 
describing what you're going to be working on. So let's say it's the garage. I really want to get the garage cleaned up. There's stuff in there I need to donate. There's some stuff I got to return to this person. And I really want the tools hung up because I'm tired of them, you know, falling over every time I go in the door. So I'm going to call my project and give it a name, the, the gratitude garage of greatness. I don't know. And then I'm going to give myself a timeline. Think about when it is that I'm actually going to be able to get this done. Um, I don't have a lot of plans as we're still under stay at home orders here in Waterloo. So maybe I'll be able to do that next weekend. And then I'm going to go through and I'm going to think about, well, what do I love about the garage? And what do I hate about the garage? And the reason is I want to preserve what I love. And I want to make sure I try and eliminate any of the things that I dislike and hate. I'll get a quick list of tasks. Tasks could be making sure that you have uh, a folding table, some garbage bags, um, making sure you've blocked it off in your calendar. And the challenges might be that, uh, you know, my, my partner's going to want to join me on that and we don't really see eye to eye on how it should be organized. Another challenge could be uh, I need to get some money together to get some hooks and things like that for hanging up my tools. Thinking about these things before you start your organizing project is actually going to make you feel less anxious, less stressed when you step into that project. And it's going to make you feel like you're a little bit more in control of something that could be challenging, something that could be time consuming. So that's tool number one. Tool number two comes to, this is something that we use on a regular basis um, of when we are going through and decluttering our belongings. So specifically, this is relating to if you're going to be doing some downsizing or you know that maybe you're going to be changing a space from its um, intended purpose and, and shifting it to be something else. Maybe somebody's moved out of the house and now that new room is going to be your art space or creative space. So maybe the bed and the chair and the lamps and things, they don't really fit anymore. But how do you let them go if there's memories attached to them? How do you let go of things that are truly difficult? When you know you want to, but every time it comes to letting them go, it's really hard to do that. I don't know if anybody's ever felt that way. If you have, please say yes in the chat box. And then I know that I've got some people listening along with me. These 12 questions, yay, thank you, Robin. Um, these 12 questions, thank you, Sarah, Rick, Eva. Oh my goodness. Okay, thank you. You are there. So the 12 questions to ask. So I'm gonna use my myself as an example. I inherited some things from when my grandfather passed away, some silver cufflings, a tie clip, um, some jewelry related things um, that I never used, but they housed this kind of like, this is how much space they took up physically. And I always had them in my bedside drawer, which is not the place they need to be. And that my bedside drawer would just fill up and fill up with stuff so easily, books, uh, napkins, tissues, these kinds of things. And it's like, why do I have this jewelry here? But every time I picked it up, I would cry. I would think of the memory of my grandfather. And I actually had to refer to these questions to help myself process letting them go because I knew I didn't need them. I knew no one in the family was wanting them. So it wasn't something that I could pass on to somebody else, but I knew that I could donate them to um, uh, the green door, which is in Kitchener um, that does like men and women's clothing uh, for the working center. And I just, I had to ask myself, am I keeping this out of guilt? I felt a little bit guilty that that was what I had received. Um, but yet I couldn't use them. And I thought if my grandfather knew. So these questions are meant to help you get to the understanding. Would my grandfather want me to be feel guilty of holding on to these things that I didn't use taking up space in a, in a, a part of my, my cupboard that I needed to use for other things? He wouldn't. Uh, and so these questions are meant to help you go through that processing system. Do you have more than one of them? Will a picture of it meet your need for keeping it? These are the types of questions that become very challenging if you're holding on to things that are difficult. Sometimes having someone else who is not connected ask you these questions can really help you process those things. So letting go of difficult items, one of our biggest tools are the questions that we ask ourselves. Tool number three, this is something that is kind of ingrained in Emilio Zanai's memory now, but it's called a clutter image rating scale. And it was created by the International Institute of Challenging Disorganization out of the US. 
Uh, they're called icd.org. Uh, and they created um, three clutter image rating scales, one of a kitchen, one of a living room, and one of a bedroom. And this is for people to help have a common language. So a lot of people will use the term hoarder uh, or someone is hoarding. And the truth is, um, it, it, if you want to correctly name it, it's called hoarding tendencies and we all have them. We start to hold on to things and call them ours. This is mine, um, basically from the age two and up. And in and around age seven to 13 is when we actually start to really hold on to and acquire things. And so we all have hoarding tendencies, but there are different levels of that. So number one on the, on the clutter image rating scale is basically a standard home that um, has more or less similar things, but spaces are pretty clear. And then on the opposite side of that, you have number nine, you have spaces that are no longer uh, usable because they are filled kind of to a capacity of holding. They're more like a storage unit that you can't walk into. And so this is how we have a common language when someone says, is this the worst you've ever seen? Generally, my answer is always no, um, because, you know, everybody's gotten to this place in for different reasons injury, inheritance, um, physical capacity is limited, mental capacity has become less limited, uh, fixation on physical belongings and their attachments or something. And there's still so much we don't know. So this clutter image rating scale, I like to have people be aware of it because it also helps you not beat yourself up. I've had many people contact us and say, I need to get organized. Stuff is crazy. I, I have so much clutter. I'm a hoarder. Um, and then when we show them um, a clutter image rating scale and compare their spaces, they're, they're three and under. And so then they can kind of relax because sometimes we're kind of fed a bit of information that things need to be a certain way and look a certain way. Um, and in reality, we're being really hard on ourselves. And we don't need to be hard on ourselves because we're already going through a lot. So hopefully this is something that's valuable to you. If you want to see the two other spaces, uh, you can go to our website. I've written a blog about uh, the clutter image rating scale and they're all there. So you can see them on our website, kwprofessionalorganizers.com. So that's a great tool. The number four, getting into the nitty and gritty of it. I can't stress this enough that you should set up a physical station when you're going to get started working. Um, here's just a little sample of us doing a paper project with someone. But you see, we just have a simple folding table. You can have more than one, but I recommend just one folding table. And this is the space that you're going to have a, a clear workspace, essentially. Anything that you might need, such as scissors, tape, label maker, whatever floats your boat, exacto knife, it's underneath. You see our green case. That's kind of our tool bag. We keep those things on hand because you don't want to be running in and out of the room. So if you're doing this in your house and we're in that garage and we're getting ready, I would set up a folding table. I would have a basket and bin underneath that would be recycling, donation. Uh, garbage is very rare. If it's not something that can be diverted, of course, have a garbage bag there. Um, and then on top is where we would bring items one by one to go through them and decide where they belong. And then we would basically sort and pile things so that we could get them into a space where everything has a home. That can be challenging for some people if you are doing this on your own, but still the value of having a table, or if you're doing it in the bedroom, throwing a sheet over top of the bed or making the bed and using that as the workspace can be really helpful. Kitchen table, ottoman in the living room, basically just giving yourself permission to have one workspace that is ergonomically feeling pretty good. It's at your, your height. You don't want to be bending over all the time, but then having everything on site not having things in other rooms that are going to make you go to another room and then all of a sudden you get distracted by something that's in there. So physical station is a great tool to use and I highly recommend it. Um, number five uh, is knowing in advance what you may do with the things that you no longer need. So before you get started and going through things, I just did a quick um, Google image search here for Donation Brantford and we've got the Brantford Food Bank, we've got Value Village, we've got the Habitat Restore, and I'm sure that there's some Salvation Armies, uh, 
potentially others um, donation centers that I'm unaware of, or even specialty ones, ones that take vintage clothing, one that takes books. Um, there's lots of different things depending on what you're letting go of especially because of COVID and schedules changing and what's accepted and what is not accepted. Um, it's great to have this information ahead of time because once you do that decluttering and you set those things aside that you may not need, the last thing you want is them sitting by the door or blocking the entry to the garage because you still have to get rid of them because you're uncertain of where they're gonna go. So the, the next tool, number five, would be knowing where are the things, where can you repurpose those, where can you give those away to. Sometimes it's online too, right? Kijiji, uh, Facebook Marketplace, just being able to snap a photo, even putting something on the curb on a nice day and saying curb alert, and then next thing you know, somebody's already picked it up. So that's really, really helpful. Another tool that I didn't want to skip over, of course, is help. Um, it's, it's highly underrated, I think, with these types of projects, but there are people who are operating in your area. You can find them registered professional organizers on that website by doing a quick search. And you can even be specific if there's, if you're focusing on photo organizing, you could find a photo organizer. If you're looking for someone to help you um, downsize an estate, there's somebody who specializes in that. Um, there are over 600 professional organizers across Canada. And so it is a large industry and it's always great to, sometimes they give uh, free consultations. So even if you just wanted to have someone in that gives you a little bit of advice, it can be really helpful. Um, and so I highly recommend just being aware of what's available in your area. And tool number seven, who loves their calendar? Uh, I specifically use a digital calendar, but I have a calendar in my journal. Why is a calendar such an important tool? because it's gonna help you know when you can give yourself time to do this. Uh, this is gonna sound silly, but I actually look forward to organizing projects sometimes because of COVID, there's not a lot to do. So, you know, Emilio and I will pick kind of a space at a time because we, yes, a, a pile up an amount things over the course of a year. And now with a daughter who grows out of things quite quickly, every year we like to go through our spaces the shed, closets, the bedroom, uh, the toy chest, and we'll go through that once a year and we'll make time in the calendar, say, hey, you know what? Okay, we've got those four hours on uh, Friday night and, it, you know, because we can't go anywhere or go out or do anything Friday night, that's pretty exciting. You know what we're going to do? We're going to clean out the, the shoe closet. Um, and so having a calendar, making a commitment, and then blocking it and kind of guarding it as something that's a bit sacred. Yes, we are going to do this. Yes, this is important. Of course, if the day comes along and you don't have a lot of energy or, or something has come up, then of course you can move it. But being a bit more intentional and saying, I've blocked this time this Saturday, I'm not going to be distracted. I am going to focus on this task because it will just make you feel that much better once you finish your organizing project. Tool number eight. This is something that isn't, uh, how do I want to say, what might be your stereo, stereotypical to-do list. The to-do list we're talking about using as a tool happens as you declutter. So every time we work with a client, we'll be set up at that table, that desk, and in that green bag, we have a piece of paper and a pen. We'll write the date on it, and then we will keep track of things that come up as you're going through things. So maybe you've done an organizing project before. You've come across a piece of paper and you say, crap, I was supposed to give this to X, Y, and Z last Saturday. I'm going to go and put it on the fridge so I don't forget. When we're working um, alone or with others, we actually want you to still stay in that place, keep that important paper to the side, but then make a note that you want to put it on the fridge if that's the best place, or you want to add something in the calendar that's going to remind you to return it to someone. Oh, here's that pair of socks that I, I've been looking for and I needed to sew a hole through it. I don't know if anybody mends their socks anymore. We're not going to take those socks and put it with the sewing. We're going to set it to the side and we're going to make a note. And so if you can get my gifs here, every time something comes along that pops an idea into your mind, mental clutter, we write it down and we purge it onto the piece of paper. And yes, sometimes this to-do list grows and grows and grows, but that's also a really great reflection tool 
So at the end of that session, not only have we gone through all of the physical things in that space and know what they are, but now we have the physical uh, list of the mental clutter onto the paper where you can reflect and be like, oh, great, I only have a few more things to do. And then I know everything's going to be looked after. Or sometimes clients will look at that list and I've typed it for them and sent it to them afterwards. And it's three pages long. They say, I don't want to do all that. And we say, that's okay, because it's normal for us to think that we can do it all. Yes, we have the best intention. Yes, I want to do that project. Yes, I want to create that painting. Yes, I want to fix that hole in the wall. Yes, I want to return this to the library. Yes, I want this subscription. But then when we look at how much time it takes to actually accomplish all of that, it's, it's unrealistic and we don't want to make time for all of those things in our life. So that to-do list is such an important tool. It's such an imp important reflection. Um, has anybody been keeping a to-do list ongoing, going, going, and it just seems like it's always growing and growing and they can never keep up with it? Because that's how I used to uh, operate my to-do list. And now I do a more reflectionary to-do list where I'll only keep a to-do list for the month. It's in my, in my journal. After that month, I really reflect on it. Do I want to move something forward? Why haven't I done it yet? Why didn't it get, didn't get done? Or am I willing to look at it and say, it's, it was a great idea when I had it, but this isn't something that I'm going to do and I'm not going to make time to do. So I'm going to let it go. And that's a great way to just kind of keep moving forward. Uh, I have an ongoing to-do list and some things never get done. Totally. And I think that's actually not a terrible thing. It's 18 months long. I love that. Thank you. Um, it's, it's not a terrible thing to have things on your to-do list that maybe haven't gotten done and, and you've been writing them down for years and years. But this is, this is an analogy I gave to um, one of my, she's a good friend. Um, she had a to-do list that I said, you need 25, 25 lives to be able to do all the things you wanna do. She's such a creative person, but her creativity and her wanting to do more, more and more projects with this long and long to-do list always put her in that state of paralyzation, not being able to move forward with anything because there were too many options. And I said, it's like you rewrite this list and rewrite write this list. It's like you, if that list was a box, it's like you keep picking up this heavy, heavy box full of stuff and just moving it around everywhere you go. And so that to-do list, sometimes it's really great. Reflect on it, dig deep. Why is that on my list? Am I, do I actually want to do that? Or am I doing that because my mom told me I should be doing it? You know, that's some of those things. That's how it used to be for me. So really look into the to-do list. Am I doing that because someone else should be doing it? Somebody delegated it to me and I'm always a helper. Um, that's me right now. Projects to do, no space, frozen. I'm liking your ideas. That's awesome. Eva or Eva. Our daughter's name is Eva. So I'm, I have a preference with that pronunciation. But yeah, it's it's hard when you're such a capable person and we have only so much motivation every day when we wake up. And then we have the, the things that come up in our life all the time that kind of take us away or try and distract us. But it's really great to give yourself permission and say, with the limited time that I have to do the things I wanna do, I'm only going to put on this list the stuff that really motivates me, the stuff that really I'm going to be satisfied once I accomplish it. And we all have the responsibilities, you know, having to call the bank to fix this, having to, you know, put this on hold while COVID's happening. All those things take up more time than we want, but need to get done. And then there's the stuff that we really want to do. So number nine, because this is time. One of our favorite tools is a timer. Uh, we use a digital timer like the ones you buy in your kitchen. We have two on our refrigerator. Um, not only is this practical in our home in terms of knowing that the pasta is cooked, knowing that the, the laundry we even use it because our laundry is on a separate floor, we set the timer when we put the laundry in so that it beeps to tell us hey, the laundry's done, you can go down, you can switch it really quick. Because how I used to do, that's an Emilio habit, by the way, that's not my habit, but I've adopted it because laundry used to take for me days because I would go and put it in the laundry and then I would forget. I would forget that I was even doing it because it's out of sight, out of mind. And then the next day I'd be going down to get something out of the freezer and I'm like, oh, 
I need to move the wet laundry into the dryer. So the timer is so practical there. But the timer, when you're working on your own specifically and organizing, can be a great reminder for, hey, are you still focused on what you said you were doing when you started the timer? Meaning if you're working at a table and you're sorting bits and bobs and that kind of thing, are you still focused on doing that? Or is it time now that you need to stand up, do a little stretch, maybe take a, a washroom break, grab a drink of water, come back and restart? Maybe some of you have heard of uh, the Pomodoro technique. Uh, the Pomodoro technique is a productivity technique, but essentially it just has you break up your work into 20 minute chunks, 30 minute chunks, but always taking a five minute break in between those chunks to get up, move around, stretch, what, whatever, and then come back down, set the timer again for another 20 minutes. Um, for some people, maybe uh, if any of you are on social media, you might uh, fall into that trap of, I'm just going on to check this. And then you look up from the clock and you're like, where did that 45 minutes go? And it's because you went down a wormhole of, of, of clicks and pictures or those kinds of things. A timer even for social media has proved, proven to be really helpful for not getting sucked in for too long as well. Uh, you know, they design them like casinos. They don't want you to get out. Um, so the timer is just such a valuable tool for alleviating the stress of your brain um, needing to remember to do something. So for example, the past is on, the laundry's on, the timer helps you forget that that's happening and then we'll come back in your life when it's important. Hey, you know, go down, get the laundry, that's happening. But it will also help you create kind of healthy boundaries in and around the way you're working. Because maybe some of you are like me, when you get into a project, you just want to like go really hard, really fast for as long as possible. But then by the time you look up and you're thirsty and hungry and you're a little bit exhausted and, and stuff is everywhere, you really could have used a little bit of that break, a little bit of that, even five minutes, step out, take a stretch, get a drink of tea, whatever it is, and then come back refreshed, ready to go. And sometimes that space out helps you reflect so that when you come back, if you were working on a difficult thing to let go or how something should be organized, it might just come to you. It might just snap back in. So the timer is a great tool that we employ all the time. Uh, number 10 might seem a little bit odd for some people, but the self-care list is something that we use with a lot of our projects, a lot of our organizing projects. Because the truth is, once you are decluttered and organized, it becomes this amazing thing where you have more time than you ever thought, but you don't really know how to use it because you never had it before. I was, uh, I was a huge shopper, huge consumer, loved having all of these tchotchke things and stuff. And so I spent a lot of my time cleaning stuff, putting stuff away, tidying up stuff. And then when I moved out of that type of um, lifestyle, I don't shop as much. I, I have very minimal things in and around my home, just the stuff I want to do. I have way more time. And so I have to learn a little bit about how do I want to fill that time now that the stuff isn't taking up all of my waking hours. And the truth is the self-care list can help you think about that. So right now, even if you wanted to write down two things of how you look after yourself, because self-care is care provided by you to you. So no one else is responsible for this. No one else can provide you care in this way. Uh, you are the number one person who knows what it is. I've given some examples on this um, that I think need to be updated now that COVID's here. Like people watching in my local library, wouldn't that be a treat? That's not really happening. But practicing deep breathing, reading a favorite book, playing a game of solitaire with real cards, those kinds of things really can help me kind of take out of my mind. I can completely remove my thought process and just sink into something like that. So coming up with some self-care um, ideas for yourself and placing them in a spot that is visual for you is going to help you go through the decluttering and organizing projects. And it's also going to help you as you go through that work to reward yourself. Great, I just put in two hours of sorting the paper. I'm ready for next year's uh, taxes. 
I'm going to go and give myself um, 30 minutes with my cat and just really give him love and hugs and all that kind of stuff and know that that's all I really need to do right now because I've done the work that I wanted to. So the self-care plan is an awesome tool. Can't say enough about it. Um, number 11 is the maintenance plan. Um, you can see the theme of planning, right? In a lot of the things that we do, this looks different for every person I've chosen um, to show you an ideal week. Um, and this is a planner that changes for me on a regular basis, maybe for you as well. Um, but knowing kind of what's coming up in your week and how you want to plan for it. You can see on this example, they do, or she does laundry kind of two nights a week. Um, they, she has a meal plan in there. She has uh, picking up the kids and she works part-time and also does online studies. But she's predicting, she's not set in stone in the schedule, but she's predicting the regular things that happen every week and she's putting in, actually, there's not a lot of stuff. I should, I should draw a better example. There's not a lot of stuff that's really for her, um, but there is white space. So that white space is potentially that time where maybe she's going for a walk. Maybe she's spending a little bit of time catching up on Facebook. Maybe she's giving herself a, a bath on Friday night or having a, a, a date night or whatever that is. I join late. Can the recording or slides be made available? Sherry, absolutely. The recording will be available through the library and I'll make sure that Chris has copies of the slides so you can have access to them. Thanks for asking. Um, and also with the maintenance plan, it could be simple uh, checklist. So often with kids too, you see a lot of checklists, but it works great with adults. So if there are things that need to be done on a regular basis to keep the house feeling tidy and feeling organized, like all the work you invested into getting organized in order to keep it looking um, clean and tidy in, in a quick GIF, maybe there needs to be a, a checklist for keeping things tidy. So making sure all the books go back up onto the shelf, returning um, or doing a little bit of sweep every Friday or whatever day works for you. Um, having these little kinds of checklists helps you maintain the work that you've invested into your organizing. And that's what we mean by maintenance plans. So they look really different for everybody. Um, and then we're on our last tool, which is number 12, uh, DIY products. So do-it-yourself products or planning for products. Um, I always save this to last, but this tends to be the thing that gets most people excited is the idea of products. And I will be very forthcoming. Generally, we don't need any. Um, every project that we've ever done, um, and we've been working since 2012, we have never purchased products in advance for any project that had to relate to decluttering or organizing. After we finished the decluttering and organizing though, there were times when a couple baskets or a nice bin or a shoe organizer really was a helpful tool for creating homes for everything that we were keeping. But I really have to say, don't shop, don't be lured in by products being the answer to an organizing project because the truth is the decluttering is your key and gateway to true happiness in your home. Once you finish decluttering, then you are capable of measuring and knowing what color, what shape, what size of product you will need that will be perfect for housing what you are keeping. If you buy products before you do the decluttering process, what we often see are piles of bins, uh, cupboards that are half bare, because after the, the products have been installed, we still get calls into brand new renovated kitchens of people struggling with organization. They did the renovation, but they're still facing the organization problem. And that's because the truth is you have to know what you want to keep. You have to know why you have it there and then set up your, your physical space, your products around what you're keeping. So here's just an example of a closet. Um, the struggle being, you know, it's hard to put my clothes away. I don't like doing the laundry. I always have way too much laundry and I need, I need to have a better closet. I need to get an installation. But after decluttering, she not only had extra hangers in abundance because the truth was half the things they were holding onto, they didn't wear. And in fact, made them feel bad 
they didn't fit anymore. That was before child number one. This was from child number two. This is, was a gift and I never liked wearing it. And so by going through that process of decluttering, going through all your belongings, all of a sudden you're going from kind of delaying pulling the Band-Aid off to I pulled the Band-Aid off and I like how it looks underneath. This feels good. And I have room to improve. I have room to grow. There are spaces and things that and now I can, you know, have my hat set up nicely or my shoes added this way. So the products, sometimes they're not all they're meant to be. Sometimes the process is looking how you store things. So this is a difference between folding shirts, um, laying vertically or standing, sorry, standing up vertically or laying flat. This is kind of a uh, not a new way of storing things, but sometimes people don't actually think about flipping how they're storing their clothes. So rolling is another option. Shoe organizers can be really beneficial for just kind of holding things in umbrellas, shopping bags, maybe masks and sanitizers now at the door. Um, be, being creative about how you hang your jewelry. Um, there's one with the coat hangers, uh, the, the woman, it's not about how much you have. She had so much jewelry and it was everywhere and it was always cluttered for her all over her dressers. And the truth was she didn't need to get rid of the jewelry. She wore a different necklace every time she went out the house. She, she just looked so beautiful all the time, so put together. The problem was how she was storing the amount of jewelry she had and we had to get creative. So three hangers on the wall not only created this really cool visual, but it was also easier to hang and replace things, never, never clumping together, never tying up. And it, it made it just so much easier to look after. Whereas somebody might walk into her um, dresser prior to that and be like, oh my God, like what a slob. But that's the judgmental side. Once we uncovered the truth of her wanting to do these things on a regular basis, getting dressed up, it, it wasn't too much. It just was the wrong system for giving it a home. Drawers can be really handy, sometimes baskets within those. Again, they don't have to look like magazines. Using old yogurt containers or Tupperware containers helps sort, you know, clips, elastics, wine openers, these kinds of things. You can get really creative with if you wanted to have organizers and you don't want to pay, you know, lots of money for the plastic ones, or you just want to test the idea, is this something I would even like? You can go ahead and you can create that out of cardboard. And maybe if you've been shopping at home, you have a little bit more cardboard than normal because everything comes, you know, shopping to the door now. Um, so these are just some of the ideas that the tools, the products is the last idea, but it also can be something that's very simple that allows you to, to, to kind of practice the idea before you commit. Because sometimes you think the product's going to be great and in reality you get it in the house and it's not all it cracked up to be. It's actually more frustrating than it was before. So I wanna leave you with those 12 tools. I know I went through them really quickly. Um, I'm really cu very curious and interested in knowing about what project you might be doing or the challenges that you might've faced in the past or are currently facing. If you could do one thing for us, if you did enjoy this presentation, we would love to see a Google review from you. You just have to type in KW Professional Organizers to Google and you can see an option on the right if you have a Google account to be able to leave us a review of what you think of this talk. Um, but now I think would be a great time that you can unmute yourself and feel free to ask any questions. Um, I'm here for you 100%. Thank you, Samantha, that was great. So if anyone has any questions, you can type it in the chat or you can also raise your hand. Could be questions about anything too. Um, maybe not even anything I talked about or. You're very welcome, Eva. Thank you so much for coming. And if there are no questions either, I totally understand. I tend to talk on and on and on. What do you use for organizing files and papers? Great question. Um, so really the idea that we can be paperless is a myth. You are required by law to hold on to tax papers, um, paperwork for deeds, paperwork for lawyers, sales, that kind of thing. And so for us, nothing really has ever come close to beating what a filing system can be. 
Now, keep in mind, I don't think that people require as many filing cabinets as what might be seen necessary in the past. You can really have a lot of things digitally now, but that paperwork you're required to keep, there is no better way to, to hold paper than to vertically stack it into organized. And how would you organize that file folder? I would, or what we always do with clients, we always sort the papers into group forms. So what makes sense for you? This is all related to my health. This is all related to school degree number one. This is all related to child number two. And you come up with those keywords, what you label those piles, and that is what's going to be the little tag at the top because it's what is going to ring a bell for you. If I created all the labels, probably you would have a really hard time finding what you needed when you needed it, because it's it would be based off of my brain, not your brain. So sort the papers into piles, let go of the stuff that you can access online. Um, in fact, if you go onto our website, I've written a blog about the papers that you need to keep here in Canada and the ones that you can consult and then the ones for sure you know you can let go of. Um, so that's our recommendation and nothing nothing beats a, a, a file folder. When you get into digital, it's a whole nother uh, can of worms, be, but because of search function, again, those keywords, how you identify what that piece of paperwork means, be descriptive, give it a good name, and you shouldn't ever really lose it. Can you share best practices for keeping children's toys organized and minimized? Um, so our daughter is two years, three months, and we do a rotational system. I have seen many different systems. Um, a good friend of mine has three boys and uh, like a 2,500 square foot home. So what is a big determiner is the space and the storage that you have available. So how much space do you want your children's toys to take up in your home? And be reasonable. Sometimes you want to have their stuff that's in the living room and maybe in their bedroom. But sometimes we go into homes where the children's toys have gone over all the rooms and that's because you've never set a boundary. So what kind of storage space do you have? Because that's gonna help you determine how much you can keep for them. But we do a rotational system because we live in a 600 square foot apartment. It's a two bedroom apartment and she has toys in her room and she doesn't have them anywhere else in the house. Um, we like to keep them and store them in her space. But then on a monthly basis, we have one big tote bin and we take her down there and we switch them out. Before, she, when she was younger, we would just switch them out for her, but we would just go through a rotation practice we have a space for books. We have a sp space for crafts. Um, it's, it's really about knowing that more is not better. And all the reading I have done on ADHD, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, um, anything um, on the spectrum rainbow, they say that it's not the amount, but it's about how it's stimulated. So if your child has access to everything, all their toys all at once, it tends to create in them potentially an anxiety or that that paralyzation that we feel when the to-do list is too long. Sometimes having an option of five is better than having an option of 20. And it's easier for them to know where things go. Getting them at our daughter was cleaning up her room at the age of one and a half. It's not because she's special. It's because we understand that for her to participate she needs to be feel she needs to be capable so things have to be at her level things have to be organized with uh, labels that she understands and so getting your children involved um, it's a whole nother talk and I, I would go on and on about it but really just knowing how much space you have and then so I don't want to miss any um, how do I know which room to start when I need to do the whole house? Shelly, this is our number one thing. Close your eyes. If you could snap your fingers and we would declutter and organize one room, which one would you pick? So you have to do them all. Sure, fine. But what's the one space that would give you the, the most satisfaction? What would eliminate so much frustration from you? Generally, the theme of when we're working with people, it's the bedroom, it's the kitchen, or it's the garage, if you have a garage. So really, there is no best place. 
but it is about what's going to give you the most satisfaction. Maybe it's having the, the dining room cleared so you can start to have family dinners again or something like that. That's going to give you energy as you keep moving through because doing the whole house, give yourself time, be patient, be loving with yourself. Storage room clean up. Is it best to get everything out or sort it bit by bit a 12 by 12 room? Storage room cleanup, again, that planning tool that I said in the beginning, is it best to get everything out? Only if you have the time, only if you know that you can do all of that work on your own, that you know where things are gonna go, you know how you wanna have it in the end. Think about the actual process of that. If you were working with Emilio and I, we would say everything's coming out. We're going to go through it one by one until we've touched everything because that's our method. But if you've only got an hour to two hours once a week, once every two weeks, you're definitely going to have to do it bit by bit. But know that bit by bit, you are going to get to the end. But do some of that planning work. As a bookkeeper, don't just keep the credit card statement chits. You need the detailed invoices. Try to organize the receipts in a box by credit card number, and they are more organized by date. That way you can just put it at the bottom or the top of the clip each time you get the receipt. Eva, totally agree. As you move through our paper system, we still keep all receipts. We have a bulletin board with um, binder clips. So as we get it, we pin it into that paper clip, at the end of the month because we run our own business we do our own bookkeeping as well and we'll just go through and we'll enter into all that data and then that goes into our filing folder so that's great great information and yes the box can be super helpful thank you this has been terrific incentive to get at it find it helpful to take more before and after pictures in the process completely agree definitely do before and afters for yourself um, cause it can, it can mean a big difference to just know where you came from to where you, be, where you got, especially with paper, paper is not visual and it takes a lot of energy. So sometimes taking the before and after of your paper is helpful. Robin, are banker boxes good or bad for storage? I see people using them, especially for files, but I think cardboard would be a problem for moisture and vermin, especially in the basement or attic. Again, I see, I see the the truth in your question about asking about it but what i want to ask is what are we putting into the bankers boxes how many do we really need uh, what is going inside of them so if it is just paper how many do you realistically need whose paper are you holding on for um, and what kind of paper do you need to be storing and it's always great to check with your advisors knowing what papers you're legally required to keep and what you can let go of what you can digitize um, you know, when the library is open, they have great um, tools. I don't know if Brantford has them. Chris, you'll correct me. Um, but the Kitchener Public Library, for example, you can scan papers like this. And in, you know, two hours, all of your paperwork's been uploaded. And there's ways of keeping that safe and stuff like that, too. Uh, only we use plastic have. tote holders because we had a flood. Good. Mm -hmm. Uh, bedroom jump to mind. Shelly, start with your bedroom, girl. Give yourself that, that beautiful sleep at night. And for tools, do you hang or store in shoe bins or some other way? <clears throat> tools is a tough question, only in the sense that how often do you use it? And what room would you use it in? Or are these the tools that are kind of stored away and only used as a problem arises? Because if you're capable, always think vertically that sometimes it's really nice to have tools visually. Um, we have a tool, um, we have two, toolboxes. So the toolboxes have their own ways of keeping things organized. And I find that to be really helpful because you can just grab the bag, bring it to the site that needs help, fix it, put them back in the bag and then put the bag away. Um, if they're tools <coughs> that you rarely use, then I think sometimes boxes could be handy. But again, it depends on what you're storing. And then question posted from Q&A, are organizations like Value Village taking scarves? I have 47, have difficulty getting rid of them. Also way too much clothing, now I've retired. So Value Village has modified, all of the um, donation centers have modified what they're taking, but they are different in each location. I re recommend calling. If you really want to let something go, 
You don't have to drop it at a donation center. If you're comfortable, you could always have a curb pickup or a, a porch pickup that if you really don't want them, if you put them for free on Facebook Marketplace or on Kijiji, you will have them gone very quickly and people do need and want things. Uh, in terms of clothing, if you have a lot, there are still bins who are accepting. Um, and I know that in Toronto, there's a cash for clothes um, and they are just interested in, in picking up clothes by weight. And so you can actually earn money for that. That's called cash for clothes, but that's again in Toronto. So just something to think about. Specifically outdoor tools, saws, blades, for example. Um, so outdoor tools, again, um, I have just this bare wall um, where you're going down into our, our, our basement from the outside, it's an old shelter. So I took that wall, I painted it with a recycled paint that I had, it's like light blue. And I put all of them up on that wall, all hanging. So they're out of the elements. They're in a place that's not really, um, no one's going to hurt themselves, nothing's going to fall on them. But it was a space that, you know, was used for nothing. And then I made it kind of the, the garden organizing uh, tool. So all my saws, my axe, that kind of stuff, it's all there. So it depends. Look at your spaces, think creatively, where do you think you can put those things? I get rid of things on Facebook, buy nothing group. That way only the person I decide to give knows my address for port pickup. Perfect. That's great, Marilyn. Thank you. Um, and I think that that is it. Eve is sharing a bit more about her receipt box. Um, you can buy plastic and get for a dollar each. Yeah, um, I will say about products and things like that too. If you are looking for buying products, I'm still going to ask you, did you declutter first? But don't always assume that more expensive is better. Um, there are times when you want to invest in a nice product that might cost a little bit more, but in reality, uh, a lot of the dollar stores or um, <clears throat> liquidation shops, they're selling the same things as what Staples is selling. They're just putting a different price tag on it. Um, so you can really find stuff that's going to help you if it's something for an investment for a longer run like our uh, filing cabinets it's in a plastic box with wheels it costs forty dollars but we've had it for nine years and i plan on having it forever so it really just depends on the the length of time in which you're looking and and trying to buy secondhand is always helpful or finding it for free so chris i don't know if you want to jump in now i think we are at our time to be respectful yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Sam. That was a lot of great information. Um, Thanks for the questions. Yeah, a lot of good questions too. Um, so I hope that everyone will be able to begin to declutter their homes and simplify their life. I just want to remind everyone to uh, register for the second webinar, Downsizing Made Easy. It's with Rolla Berger from Move With Compassion and it will be on May 26th at 2 p.m. And also please check out our webinars and programs on the home-based activities page of our library website. So I'd just like to thank Sam and I'd like to thank everybody for coming today and I hope to see you at the next one. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for all your organization and putting together this programming. You're welcome. I will send you the PDF slides as well. And then if anybody messages you, you can always email it to them. Okay. And I have recorded this. Uh, so I will figure out how to do that and send you the recording. And also if you want to send me the invoice, that would be great. Great. And I think everyone has now signed. Well, we still have a few more people signed in. Um, but I think that's great. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you for having me. You're no problem. And I think we'll end off. Everybody else is finished and I'll sign off for the meeting. Great. Thank you so much. And we'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye, Chris. Take care. Bye, Robin. Thank you. Yeah. You too. Bye.